The image on the left was ruined by SpaceX's Starlink network. The image on the right wasn't, except the data collected for both images is exactly the same. No, really. Now you could say to me, hey, Michael, you just took these photos at different times, or you just photoshopped out the lines made by Starlink. And while both of those are totally possible, the reason these two images are actually the same is a little easier than that. And let me show you exactly why. The point I actually want to make here is that there's two possible narratives. Either A, Starlink is an insurmountable and permanent loss to a science or a hobby, or B, this is no big deal and nothing tangibly worse than what we already have to deal with. Or could both extremes be wrong and it's actually something in the middle? Let's explore the answer and I'll let you come to your own conclusion. If you are already a hobbyist deep sky astrophotographer, then you probably already know where I'm headed with this. But maybe you're still concerned about Starlink's impact on the hobby. Or others of you might be interested in or critical of Starlink. Or maybe you're part of team popular rich guy bad and can readily find ruined astrophotos from the last few months. I also have another video on the subject if you want to check that out. But you don't have to watch that video first. I provided what I thought was a much more thoughtful and balanced approach to how Starlink may or will impact astrophotography. But please check that one out too, if I've piqued your interest. The link will be up here and at the end of this video as well. Astrophotography actually works very differently than what you might be used to. With normal daytime photos, when taking a picture, the shutter is open for just hundreds of a second, sometimes even less, and you get a nice, crisp moment in time. Perhaps at night, you might have a longer exposure time, but you have to be very steady and your subject can't move or it will be blurry. Or you could deliberately go for an aesthetic where a photo gives you a sense of motion. Sorry if this is really basic stuff for a lot of you. I'm going somewhere with this and I'm just trying to draw some comparisons. Exposure time is just how long you're giving a piece of film or a digital image sensor to collect light. Or in other words, just how long the shutter stays open. And if there's a change in the scene over a given exposure time, you'll get motion blur. Long exposures mean that fireworks don't look like points of light spreading from a central core, but instead turn into umbrella shapes, for example. With deep sky astrophotography, we are instead talking about not exposure times of milliseconds or even a few seconds, but 20 seconds or a minute or five minutes, or perhaps even more than that. The shutter is held open for a long time to try and capture as many photons over a given period of time as possible into one final image. The targets in the night sky are extremely faint, many of them completely invisible to the naked eye. Most of the time, the subject isn't moving, so long as it's tracked or changing in any tangible way during the exposure. But a lot of things can happen in that time. Satellites, fireflies, meteors, planes, even if they are only in the path of the image for tenths of a second, they'll still show up in the final single picture. Plus, there's sensor noise just by virtue of doing long exposures. And that noise comes from many other sources, like heat or imperfections in the hardware or software in a digital camera. Film grain in the past had many of the same kinds of problems. To combat all of this, we don't just take one image of a celestial object, but dozens or even hundreds called sub-exposures, then stack them. Stacking is a vague concept and can mean different things. So let's actually demonstrate this in Adobe Photoshop, working with Comet NeoEyes, photobombed by Starlink. To start things out simple, I'm going to work with three tracked 20 second exposures of Comet NeoEyes, taken all within the span of one minute. In each sub-exposure, we can see the streaks of several Starlink satellites. This was a recent batch of satellites launched by SpaceX. And so at this time, they are still quite close together. Each individual satellite is going to travel across several degrees of the sky in this span of this 20 second exposure. And there's nearly 60 of them. So it takes several minutes for this entire Starlink train to pass through the image as seen in this time lapse. So for three images in a row, several streaks are seen over Comet Neowise. The most basic form of astro stacking means averaging the pixels of each image one by one on top of each other. I'm going to line up all three images as best I can and then set the opacity of the second layer to 50% and the third layer to 33%. That means each layer is responsible for one third of the data in that image. My new image has less background noise than any one image, but check out what happened to the Starlink train. Each streak is getting quite a bit more dull, while you can also see the streaks from all three pictures at once. Since this is an average stacking method, this makes sense mathematically. If we have three images and a particular pixel has a Starlink satellite in just one image, that pixel will now be one third as bright in the stack because Starlink simply wasn't in the exact same place for all three images. You'll also notice there are gaps in between the streaks. This is due to the camera ending one exposure and starting another. So there's no light being collected for almost a full second in between sub exposures. And so you'll see these gaps. 
If I were to go further and stack, say, 30 images, each Starlink streak would be 1 30th as bright as the original. Perhaps at that point, you might not even see them anymore. But that's just averaging, and this is just Photoshop. I'll go deeper with some different software next. But first, I'll try a different method of stacking, this time, maximum stack. Using this method, only the brightest pixel in a series of images is kept. The darker pixels in each sub-exposure in the stack are rejected, and only the brightest pixel wins. Photoshop calls this blend method lighter color, but it means the same thing as maximum. Now we see each Starlink streak every bit as bright as the original, times three. Suppose I use this same maximum method with a wide field image I made on a different date of Comet Neowise. Starlink is nowhere to be found, but there are still fireflies, meteors, a couple satellites. My hope is that what I'm showing you here demonstrates that this method of stacking is almost never used, because it's bad. One exception might be during a meteor shower, making a composite and wanting to make sure each meteor streak is as bright as the last. Now let's take this to the extreme. Photoshop is better suited for finishing photos, but not the best tool for stacking. One powerful and free stacking program is DSS, and here we can automatically align, stack, and calibrate 60 images of Neowise all in one go. We also have more stacking options to work with, such as Kappa Sigma clipping. Sigma is a data concept that we can use to mathematically reject data that is way out of bounds compared to average. For example, a line of pixels in just one image containing a satellite would be considered outliers, and those pixels are just ignored. So the comet stays put, the stars stay put, and any out-of-bounds data that was in only one single image gets rejected. The average method over 60 images, just like you saw at the beginning, did just fine eliminating Starlink streaks. But Kappa Sigma does an even better job under certain circumstances. DSS can also do a maximum stack. Again, only the brightest pixel from each image is kept. This is an unusual stacking method and reserved for special use cases. One of those use cases is to make Starlink look like it would be devastating to deep sky astrophotography. Never mind the three other non-Starlink satellites and the meteor that are also picked up or the obvious gaps in between streaks proving this image was made just for this purpose using this method. While I have several concerns about Starlink and I'm happy to see that SpaceX is experimenting with sunshades and special coatings to fix or minimize the problem, I'm also surprised by some of the massive pessimism and, let's be honest, somewhat dishonest methods being used for making this point. Maximum stacking is generally bad, and if this was the only method available to us, I can't imagine a stacked, long-duration astrophoto that wouldn't be ruined by any number of things without extreme luck. Just to make a final point here, I mentioned in the other video that it's really the more recent launches that would give us this problem to solve. Once boosted into proper orbits, these Starlink satellites, at least so far, are indistinguishable from other satellites. And I made a point that someone somewhere on any given night is going to have a problem eventually with a recent launch. And because Neowise was for a few days only visible above the horizon for about an hour after astronomical twilight when these satellites are illuminated by the sun, Neowise therefore was especially susceptible to this happening. However, I had photographed the comet in this way 14 different times during the month of July. And Starlink photobombed Neowise just once in those 14 sessions. And as far as I'm concerned, it still didn't really matter for the final result. And finally gave me a chance to give us all a teachable moment and to take something that probably seemed a little bit theoretical and actually put it into practice. Hopefully between this quick video and the first one, I've helped you understand some new background on how astrophotography is produced while providing a more even approach about Starlink's impacts on the hobby and on astronomical research. Thank you so much for watching. If you are new to my channel, I have other videos about astronomy, weather, rare events, the outdoors, and this is all content that I produce myself. They are my own experiences that I share and explain. If you'd like to join me on this channel's journey, click subscribe, check out my other social media, or join us on Discord. The links are below. And a special thanks to the more than 5,000 subscribers that have joined me in 2020 so far. That is six times as many as I had at the end of 2019. Your support has kept me motivated and focused at a time when those two things really just don't come that easy. So thank you. Until the next one, let's get out there and learn something new.